Hi guys, Jay Lark here. Um, so a couple of my apprentices have been complaining about album design and book design and um, going back and forth. So um, I figured while I have an hour between critiques, uh, since I'm working on one, I would just uh, screen share and show you guys how I design mine. Um, I think for me it's really important to uh, to have personalization in the whole process. So I think the book is just as much a piece of art as the images that are going in it, and I want the book to accentuate that for me. Um, so I custom design everything. I'm trying to find the link so that I can actually share it so you guys can hop on if you want. And, and I can't. <laughs> so bear with me for a second. Um, why can't I see it? It's usually under view. Hmm. Watch me make faces at myself while I deal with technical difficulties. Um, okay, well, I guess you guys are just watching then because I can't find the status bar to be able to share the link in the event. Um, hmm. Grumpy. Um, I don't think, oh, there we go. Oh, I got it, yay! Little things make me so happy. Okay. So here is the link. If you would like to hop in and ask questions. Okay. Now we're all set. Okay, so um, now that I've been doing it for a while, and I really don't do weddings very much anymore. Um, except for if I actually know the person, it's usually like personal favor for people that I'm going to be at anyway. So, uh, there you go. You guys can see that. So I actually have a whole bunch of templates that I work off of that I built and then it cuts my editing time, but I want to show you guys from the beginning. So I am working with Fineo, um, who I love. I think their albums are beautiful. Um, but there's a lot of really beautiful album companies. I love them for their customer service. Their customer service is bar none. Um, and I brag about them and love on them so much that they ended up sponsoring me, but I was using them for a while before they actually sponsored. Um, so just in the interest of disclosure. So, uh, we're going to design a 10 by 10 album. Um, and Fineo has, um, actually I guess I'll, I'll exit out of that and start it over. Um, Fineo has uh, a three-fourths inch guideline, so whatever album company you're working with, you want to uh, chat with them and see what their bleeds are and their cut sizes to make sure that you're not putting like frames and text outside the safe zone. Um, so you can see I have like the little bars here, and if you haven't, um, if you haven't done this yet with the little guidelines you just literally go up and put your uh put your mouse or your cursor on the ruler above and then just bring it down to where you want it to be so i like a like a three quarter inch safety zone and this one's actually off a little bit okay so these are my safe zones um on the outsides of those nothing important in the info goes there and then i have the middle one which is my uh my page fold so i know i'm not putting any important info there okay and then the way that i do it is i just go through and i want a collection of images that are both uh detail shots and then the important info and for me the detail shots are kind of like shooting b-roll on a uh, a video. So let's go find one. Actually, let's go to the end here. 
Um, so basically anything that people aren't in is pretty much a B shot for me. And there's certain ones that make the cut, um, like the rings, uh, the cake, you know, things that are really super significant, um, as props, they'll be, uh, supporting roles. So they'll get their own images. Um, but stuff like this is important to have in there, but it's not essential to um, be given like top billing. So right now I'm designing a 10 by 10 album. So it's real simple. You're just going to start a new file and make it 10 by 20 because you design it in spreads. And then if you guys are on the event page, um, you're just going to go and uh, click on the link there if you want to jump in and ask questions or whatever. So um, so this is pretty good. This covers most of it. And then I'm going to go in and go with my paintbrush. And I'm going to sample from the areas around it. Um, and you want to make sure that your hardness is at zero and your opacity is around 100 give or take. And then all I'm doing is filling in these lines. And I'm just sampling from around so that it bleeds in. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You just want to get the general idea so that you have info on your whole page, right? So now this area here is my negative space where there's nothing essential. So the, the shoes are the shot. Um, they're the star of the page right now. The flowers are the supporting actress. And then I have pretty much, you know, half, if not three quarters of the first spread that's empty. So then I'm going to go in and I'm going to look for important photos. And there's a couple of things that you guys should be paying attention to. Like this one's a good one. Um, but for the first one, we're just actress, and then I have pretty much, you know, Hi. not three quarters of the first spread I that's empty. Me talking. But then I'm going <laughs> to go in and I'm going to look for important photos. And there's a couple of things. There we go. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, so. Um, because the background image is black and white, I'm looking for black and white photos. So I got two here of him getting ready, which are good supporters. And again, you just want to make sure that you're keeping them outside those lines. So I don't want to come across here because when they trim the pages, especially Fineo, because they hand cut them, it's entirely possible that they'll cut above this line and then this is falling off the edge of the page and it doesn't look as good as having the border. So um, three quarters of an inch is really generous. They The safe zone's only like an eighth of an inch or three eighths of an inch I think so three quarters gives me plenty of space to make sure that I'm gonna have that border around which is why I bring it in so far um, and then we'll go back through let's see what we got we got lots of background shots this is a good one too Um, and feel free to ask questions, guys, or talk about who you're working with or whatever else I can help with. And then that little purple line that's popping up is just letting me know that I'm even with the other pictures so they're the same size. Now, I think that those are a little bit too close to the flower for my liking, so I'm going to go in now, and now that they're the same size, and I'm going to um, select them both, block it for proportion, and then just shrink it a little bit more. The purple line all the way across says that I'm center on the page. 
Um, now I'm looking at ratios and looking at the difference between the size from the edge of the page to the inside and then from the top to uh, the top of the image and the bottom to the bottom of the image and those are disproportional so I'm also paying attention to those so I'm going to pull them in a little bit more and even out the space a little bit and then I'll go in and just shift that up a little to even out the space in between. And then I'm just going to make sure it's centered again. And that's it. Like, that's page one. Um, but the thing that you want to pay attention to is that there isn't too much info. It's not too busy going on. And then you're also paying attention to color. So the reason that I selected uh, black and white images is because the background's black and white. It would not look as good if we took, say, this one and did the same exact thing. <clears throat> one, you want to make sure that your pictures are in your negative space because there's so much visual info here that it competes with the other images. And two, the black and whites don't look like they fit with the image because they don't because of the color. Um, so color theory is important to pay attention to. But even if we took them um, and slid them over here and then following the same line of thinking, just followed the color, I still, I don't like it as much as I do with the black and white. But you can see the difference that it makes when you have them over important info as opposed to in negative space. So that's always, I pay attention to that when I'm shooting, that I want to leave negative space in the photo. Um, and I'm also paying attention to it with my exposure. You'll notice with mine a lot, I tend to blow out the highlights in the negative space, like even with this one, even though it's yellow, like this is all overexposed here and you can even see it on the edges of the flowers, but I like that because when things are overexposed they fade into white or I'll underexpose them into dark. That way it's giving me negative space to play with because if everything is perfectly sharp and in focus then it's really hard to find um, spaces on pictures like this to put the images that they're not getting lost in all the detail work and the texture in the, the organization. So we'll go and undo this. If we don't like the yellow, there we go. Um, now if you're just getting started with the idea of designing your own albums, um, what I'll do is I'll go and lay one out initially in a specific size. So, and it doesn't have to be um, for every size. So I don't need an album in six by six and eight by eight and ten by ten. I'll just design one as fourteen by fourteen because it's still square. Um, and then you can re, um, you can basically just lock the ratios and resize it and take it from fourteen to fourteen to ten by ten if I need to if I'm doing a smaller album. Um, but this will get saved as essentially a template. So I save it as a PSD file. Now, one of the other things that you can do if you're going to save it as a file is we're actually going to take these and we're going to select if we like that size layout. And then we're going to select the underneath layer. So I'm actually on this layer even though I'm following the cutout of this. And then I'm just going to hit delete. And what that's doing is that's leaving this space empty then. And then I can do it with the same thing. I'm going to come over here and select this one. And I'm going to hit delete. Okay, so now what I have is I have space between those. 
Oops, let me, let me move this down. So the next time I'm designing an album, um, and I can do this, I would originally do this on a top layer. I did this on the actual image, but you would do this on a top layer so that you can drop other photos in. So your first photo, if I'm going to design it now, let's go to a different image. If I come back to this one and I go, okay, I really love this layout. I want to use this layout for this image. Now I can take it and I'm going to select my top layer and I'm going to go one below it. See how that fills in? So I've seen other people do this where they won't actually have this as an image. They'll just pick colors or textures to fill the page, and then they can drag and drop photos in. So right now, this is one photo over both of them. But if I wanted this photo to go here, then I would just hit Command-T, and that brings up my sizing. And then I can sit and I can play with the info and decide, like, OK, I want this to be a close-up shot of the flowers. So where's the best? flowers because we don't want to put it like this and have all this negative space in a feature photo so we'll go and um, I really like the blue one I'm gonna leave it right here that's about how big I want it and then you can just go in select the overfall and delete it and then that's in your image Um, but then you would, so it becomes a lot easier, and you can actually design them as templates, but if you um, take the next picture, take this one, and then we'll just minimize that. Okay, and so we want to design it the same way, so because we're paying attention to the negative space, we'll flip this one, and we'll lock it. Okay, and then I'm going to take my paintbrush and I'm going to sample colors that are nearby. And you want to sample a couple of times because they're not always the same. So if I pick just this color and go down, then you get a stark line. But if I'm paying attention to what I'm doing and I'm sampling everywhere, and you can adjust the size of your brush too, I'm just doing it fast to kind of give you an idea then you can see how it starts to kind of blend in. Um, and it's not perfect, but it also doesn't have to be because um, you're putting images over top of it, so you're not going to see all of that. Could you also use the stamping tool? Say that again? Could you also use the stamp tool? Yeah, absolutely. You can. I used the paintbrush tool because I started out as a painter. <laughs> That's really it. Okay, so we're still selected on this layer, but we're going to make this layer visible so we can see where uh, our cutouts are. And then you would just basically mimic that. And you can go through and select it that like that. But once you have them cut out, um, you can also just, oh, well, it helps if I'm on the right layer. Um, you can go to the top layer and select, and it'll select the square for you, and then just switch down to the bottom layer so that it's actually cutting out that. And then we get rid of that layer. Now we have the same background in that one. And then we can go and pick our other photos. Let's grab this one. Oh. And you just want to make sure that you're below that layer. And then resize. I always lock it so that I have the right ratio. And then just decide what the size is, where it fits, and it's already set to the right size. So it, even though there's overlay, it doesn't matter because it's behind it, so it looks right. So most of the time, I don't even have to bother about cropping the photo to the right size or getting it in the right ratio.
So let's go back because I like this layout. Um, so once I have it, Then you just want to make sure that you're, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's like, when once you cut them out, you just got to make sure that you have it lined up over so that you're not getting uh, transparency or it'll leave weird lines, which of course I've never done. <laughs> so that looks good. And then you'll just go and you'll save it as a, um, if you want to save it so that you can use it the spread again with your next thing, then you save it as a PSD file, and then I'll also save it into the client album as um, as a high res JPEG, um, so that we can upload them into the software. So we can. And what's what software is that that you upload them into? Um, I just. Uh, Fineo, I use Fineo, so when you go on their website and you go to order, they just allow you to drag and drop the um, the files in individually as full page spreads. Um, and I love them. Their, uh, their customer service wins me over. I mean, their work is beautiful too, but there's a lot of beautiful companies. Like if you go to... Um, WPPI or PPA, like any of the conventions, there's 50 album companies and they're all using the same products um, and the same prints, but Fineo, we've had a couple of uh, user errors and they take care of it so fast, like they made the mistake, um, which is awesome. Cool. Okay, so let me screen share and I'll show you um, I'll show you two albums. Let's see. I'm just going to share something different. Um, that should be it. Okay. So, for me, all my albums are arranged by year so that I can find them easily. So, the first time I did one, I did an album template for a square album. Uh, well, yeah, let me show you the original. Um, the shoot, 2010. Mm. Oh my goodness, what year was she? Okay, so this was the first album. That we designed with it. And you can see same kind of theory we're following the um, negative space kind of things. Mm -hmm. So the entire page is designed as an image, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now this one, I broke my color theory rule, but it was okay because it breaks, like, the edge of the uh, vanity mirror that he's at is actually at the center of the page, um, and it's not true black and white on the other page. It still has a little bit of the yellow tone, so it's more sepia, um, so it fades in.
And a lot of these, I took time to actually like blend the photos together. So I took the time to cut out along the back of her dress mm -hmm. um, so that I could put the second photo in, and it looks like they fit. Um, so it just depends on how much time you want to do it. If you don't like album design, because I can sit and play in Photoshop all day. It doesn't bother me at all. But if you don't like album design, then you're looking more towards ones like this and that, which you can still get them. If I, I always do a group shot. This always sells as a big print for them. I always make $500 off of this picture. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the night, it's all the it's all the warriors, the people that loved you enough to stay and get really, really drunk with you and celebrate your wedding. Um, we do like an end of the night shot with all of the guests that are there. Um, and then you just want to keep in mind that an album is a book, so it should tell a story. So you want to pay attention and just make sure that when you're designing that images that fit together um, from a storytelling perspective also fit. Yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, when you do, like, sep sepia, do you do a, a preset, or do you blend it yourself to get the... I don't, I don't use presets um, or filters or anything like that, just because I don't want my work to look like everybody else's. Um, and I think because I started out as a painter, um, it resonates with me to put my brush to the to the paper even if it's a digital pen. Um, so it's, you know, it's like my grandma cooks with love kind of thing. Like these people are paying a lot of money. When I was doing weddings, I was getting between eight and twelve thousand dollars per event. It deserves more than a preset. Um, that said, I think now that I've been shooting for so long, I kind of know my style enough that some of it is almost on autopilot. Um, because I know what I want it to look like, so my retouching time is is minimal. Um, I can go through an entire wedding's worth of images in a couple of hours. Okay, so you can see that one of the whole wedding party, which is a really good way to do the whole wedding party. So then if we go back now and go to... Uh, where's her sign? So Darison, Daria, and Harrison, um, they are the same exact layout. So, but it looks totally different. Um, this image, for example, is very orange and yellow and has those bright orange and pink flowers from the first wedding on the side. Um, and then a couple of pictures of the wedding dress on the first one. So they don't look the same because I take the time to make sure that they're laying out, but it's the same exact layout, and you're getting a totally different feel for the album because of the way that the detail shots are, different colors. So you can, you can play with it, and you wouldn't look at the two albums side by side and go, hey, this looks exactly like the last album, which I think is part of the problem when you're using pre-designed layouts and presets. Um is that all of the books start to look the same, which is why I don't like having, usually 90% of the albums I see, um, these three images will be here, but the rest is white or black. Like, they leave a lot of empty space, which when I started looking at them, I was like, I would be really annoyed as a bride to pay thousands of dollars for empty pages. I don't understand why they'll put three images on one side and leave the other spread completely empty. Like, I'm paying you to take pictures. I don't care about white space. That's like eight pages in the album that I paid for that have nothing on them when you count them up. Um, so I don't personally like to do that, but you'll notice um, if they're not... Uh, sure which one is the lead image. Like, this is a beautiful image of the flowers, but the uh, the background is uh, grayed out, the opacity is turned down, and it's matted so that it doesn't compete. Because if these images were on top of this one that's super bright, there'd be so much information going on visually that you wouldn't be able to pay attention to what you were supposed to look at, and it gets, it gets visually tiring. Um, especially with a couple like this where everything they did 
was super busy. Like, they were just really amped and happy. It was a superhero-themed wedding. There was just bright colors everywhere. It's super saturated. Their programs were comic books. There's just tons of detail elements everywhere. So you have to find the space to be able to um, grant each image its own moment on the page. What's, what's the typical dimension for an album? I like the square ones. Um, I think they're big enough to uh, let each image stand on its own because if you have too many images, then they're so small that you're like squinting while you're looking at them, mm -hmm. um, which I don't want. So this enables me to have big images, um, and then when you have really good images to give them full billing, on the page. Like this one of these two little mafia ring bears I just love to pieces. And it was great because I caught the bride in it and she didn't even know I got that shot. Um, but it still has enough room on the page to feature this as a full page spread, which is essentially like almost an 8x10 print at that point because it's 10x10. 10 10. Um, and then still include a couple more of the detail shots she wants so it doesn't look too busy. Um, especially when you have the wonderful problem of them liking so many of the images that they're like, oh, we narrowed it down. We only want about these 300, and you're trying to get that into a book. Mm -hmm. So my general rule now, because they'll pick, and the bride especially, she'll pick the images that she thinks she looks skinny in. If she looks hot in it, she's going to pick it. It doesn't matter what the image is of. Um, she'll pick 50 pictures of her, and the groom will be nowhere in them. Um, so if they're picking a lot of images, and because there's that sentimental factor too, and it's, you know, she wanted all of the pictures with her dad, and actually her dad um, passed away uh, a couple of months after the wedding. He wasn't doing well. So it was like, it was a big deal that he walked her down the aisle, and you can see that um, all over her face in this bottom one here. Mm -hmm. Like, she's just... So happy, and so um, he passed away after the wedding, but before she picked out her photos, so every single photo of her and her dad made it into the album, of course, because she's, not only is it emotional and her daddy walked her down the aisle, but now she's also in a state of grieving, so these became essential, um, maybe a little more so than they would have if he was still around when she had selected them, so... When, when you shot the wedding, um, was it just you, or did you have, like, other assistant photographers? This one I shot by myself. So this is probably my busiest spread, and it's the same one that we did in the last album, because I love having individual photos, because every single one of the people in the bridal party are essential to the bride or the groom. That's how they get on there, so I, you know, while it's great to have you know, the group photos like that. I want to have moments, and you can see their personalities and what kind of friends they are based on it. Like, some of them are very pretty smile forward, and some of them are making goofy faces and, and being dumb together, which tells you all about their friendship in a single image, which is awesome, and you don't get that from the group shots. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a really popular layout that everybody's like, oh, I love this, and it still gives you a moment um, to shoot an image of the bride and groom as well. So I'm always looking for the image that's at the bottom right here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's flipped in the other album, which I'll do a lot too to show difference. So in the first one, we were looking at the couples over here and the images go that way. Um, but I'm looking for places I can put them that I can shoot a lot of empty space up and around them um, that I can fill in with color then so that it's not competing. Same thing, you can see it here. Now this one I actually took, um, and I took all of this and mirrored it over here mm -hmm. um, and just copied and mirrored it to make it flow, but it, it actually works visually rather than just blacking it out. It just depends on how much time you want to put in, but I'm still, I had up until like right here is the edge of the image, which gave me lots of negative space to play with. Do, do you ever um, soften the edges of those, you know, because those have, like, very hard square edges. Do you ever, you know, soften those edges so it's more seamless? For these ones? Yeah, for, for any of them. 
Um, on occasion, but not, it depends on what I'm looking. Her, she liked the box kind of layout because her whole wedding was like superhero themed. So she, it reminded her of comic strips. Gotcha. Um, but there were a couple more softer ones that kind of bled into each other in the first album that didn't make the spreads. So sometimes, even though I'm working off of it, it cuts my time down in half to be able to pull up a spread I've already designed and, and basically drag and drop photos. Um, and just find that works. But a lot of times I'm making new spreads for new clients too to make sure that their photos fit. So you don't want to round, round peg square hole it and try to force it um, just to get done. But if you're, this album cost them, they spent, they got two parent albums too. So they spent $4,500 on albums. I can take 10 minutes and make a new spread at that rate. Yeah, I'm, I'm supposed to do a wedding in October, so this is good. Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. Like this one, it's blended mm -hmm. in, blended in smooth, more smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, if it works, and you know, and it's totally fine to do all of your layouts like this if this appeals to you more. Um, just be careful you don't go to like the 1970s white vignette kind of feel. Um, now, before I worked with. Um, Fineo, I worked with Graphy Studio, um, and they actually have a bunch of pre-designed templates, and some of them are, are squares and cutouts, and others are blending, um, and that's super easy to just drag and drop. They have their own software, um, and they do beautiful albums, too. Uh, they're based out of Italy, and it was taking a long time for me to get my books, so as long as, um, as, long as your clients are informed that it's you know, whatever time it takes you to create the album, plus usually like one to three months, uh, depending on what time of year it is, for them to actually print and bind and send it to you. Um, uh, they're based out of Italy, and it was okay. taking a long time Hi. to get my books, so as long as, um, as long as I can hear the recording of myself on your, <laughs> on your screen. Um, so once you get that shut off, then you can unmute. Um, so I liked, uh, I liked Graffy Studio a lot. Their quality was really good, um, but they're based out of Italy, so it was really hard at any time I had any kind of issue. And they do have people, like, they have local, uh, local bases of operation in the States, um, which are really good now, but, um... It just wasn't very intuitive. I didn't like their website. It was it was little things. It had nothing to do with the album company. It was it was just little things that irked me until I left. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to find one that works well for you. And for me, I think I'm a hands on kind of person. So having um, having the ability to actually sit and touch the pages and look through physical albums is totally different. Uh, than looking at spreads or looking at their website. So I always pick all the companies I work with after I'm at WPPI or, you know, one of the expos that I'm teaching at. Um, I always make sure to go and actually see the products because very rarely will I buy off on anything before I actually look at the physical uh, copy of it. That being said, I also think it makes a huge difference with your clients for them to be able to sit and page through an album um, and sit and hang out with you than it does uh, to do online sales. My sales doubled and tripled once I started doing the champagne reception. So when my clients come in, the way that it works is they book the wedding, I go and I shoot the wedding. Once I get the pictures edited, I invite them in for a champagne reception and they get to go through all of these pictures as photographs. I have a slideshow, I have champagne, I have the whole event catered. They can bring their parents, their bridal party, whoever they want to come. Usually we have like 10, 12 people that they bring with them. Everybody oohs and ahs, um, and I usually give them $250 off if nobody cries <laughs> at any point during, and I win that money back at least half the time, but it's a, a fun way to play. And then we'll go through and we'll see them all. So it's totally different when I can control the setting that they're at, when they're surrounded by their loved ones and their daddy is looking at them in the wedding dress and the mom's like, oh my god, you look so beautiful. Um, it makes a huge difference um, in their reaction and the emotional attachment that they have to 
the photos as opposed to when they're sitting at work and they're like, I want to see my wedding photos because I can't wait. And they're like, oh, yeah. And they're like putting their work window in front of it every two minutes as their boss is coming. Um, so it's a totally different different scenario. It's the same thing even if they're home, you know, and the dog's barking and the kids are like, Mom, I need juice, you know, or whatever else is going on. It's totally different than um, putting them in the right environment. So the experience translates to dollars all the time. Um, so they'll come in, they'll look, and then we'll go on my website and I have private albums. So once they see them and I control the first um, viewing, then they can go online and they can pick their photos. Now usually I'll have I'd say 200 to 250 pictures in an album when all's said and done. I mean we got six just here and then 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that's 14 on two spreads, but then we'll have single spreads um, and a lot like this. But even when I'm giving full page billing to a photo, I'm still usually managing to put two or three pictures alongside it. So it adds up fast. So I aim for 200 photos. I think 200 is enough, but I also do 40, 40 to 50 page spreads. So the album's thick. Um, so most album companies that I've worked with, their price on their website for the album is for 20 spreads. And then you upgrade per spread, so you pay additional there, and then you upgrade for different cover options and things like that. Um, I have it in my head that they're getting 50 spreads, um, but I only let them pick out up to 100 photos. So they pick out the first hundred, which means a whole bunch of them add up. And the reason that I do that is, one, I want images that work together. So if they only pick one image, like if she was like, I really need to have this picture of my dad, and he's like, I really don't care. My mom and I don't really get along, which is not the case. They, they love each other, and it was great. But if he like left that out, and then I had 20 pictures of her and her dad, then the story becomes more about her and her dad, and she might not even notice. Like I said, you know, she's grieving, so she puts in every photo of her dad, and she's not paying attention to the fact that she has 20 pictures of her dress and four pictures of her shoes and only three pictures with the groom, you know? So this enables me to even out the story and look for where there might be uh, missing elements. And it also enables me to make sure that, like, you know, this picture of her aunt and her cousin doesn't end up on the same spread as one of the pictures here when, it should be, when this page is very much a story about them cutting the cake and kissing each other with the cake, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, most of the time it gives me the chance to pick my shots too because they might look at it and not pick photos that have a lot of negative space around them because they want all the vibrancy and the fullness and the close-ups. So they'll pick detail shots that are very much um, like the ones that are at the beginning. Oh, my goodness. Is there a file size limit to, to each spread? And um... Say that again. Is there a file size limit to each page? Um, if there is, I haven't hit it yet. I just set them for the right size. So this is a 10 by 10 album. So it's 10 by 20 um, for the file size. And then they're always at 300 DPI because they're being printed. Always. Um, and then the images um, go on the pages from there. But it's I'll save them as a PSD file um, if I want to use the layout again. But the image that's going in the album is saved as a JPEG to be uploaded to the database. Mm -hmm. Do Does that make sense? Them, yeah. Do you save them as a sRGB or a, a Adobe 1998 or does it matter? Uh, I think it depends on who you're working with. You want to uh, check in with your print lab and see what their files are and if they have... A lot of album companies and print companies now will also have um, calibration files. I'm trying to like turn off my screen share while I'm still on the other screen. Um, they'll have uh, different uh, calibration profiles and stuff, so you can actually calibrate your monitor to their printers, which is really helpful too. So I've noticed... Um, like, I got a box set done of family portraits from the ones Lindsay Adler did for us um, with the Game of Thrones things. And 
The box set looked great from Fineo, but the cards that we got for Christmas were super dark from w, uh, WHCC, and it's because of their printing calibration. So what looks fine and properly exposed on that one looks really dark and oversaturated in their album. So um, when you're looking for album companies and print companies, that's definitely something that you should be looking at. And then the best thing to do is really just go get a couple of test prints done. Um, they don't have to be big, four by sixes are fine, but get a couple done and just see how they're measuring up as compared to what you're seeing on your screen um, and working there. I'm actually in the process right now. I won't do it for companies like Fineo works great for my boxes, for my boudoir clients and for my albums, um, but I'm getting ready to do super huge wall prints of uh, some of the fine art project that I'm working on. Um, I have to be hands-on, so I've, my assistant has been researching nothing but local print labs and bookstores for the last week. She's, like, ready to kill me. Um, so that I have somewhere that I can actually go in and sit down and go, look, this is what it looks like. This is what I need you to make it look like. I don't know what I'm doing. Fix it for me. Um, and... I just like having my hands on the actual process. So uh, that's the only downside that I have to working with companies like Fineo and stuff is they're usually on the other side of the country if they're even in the country. So I can't go in and sit down and go, this is what I'm after. Um, so when you are working with a company that you can't walk in the door of, I think it's really, really important that they have um, good customer service and a lot of patience because that's a, a whole art in itself just printing and I know nothing about it. All I know is that um, this looks red on my screen and it looks hazard cone orange in the print and I don't know why. Um, so let's fix it. And it's usually user error um, which is why I think it's really important to have people that are knowledgeable and are able to explain why it works and what you need to do to fix it rather than just telling you, yep, that's wrong. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I did. I mean, for my fine art stuff, I like to print on aluminum on metal. So um, I, my my goal this year is to do one large metal print, uh, uh, at least one large one a month. So um, that's what I did. I, I got some print samples from a bunch of other places, and uh, you know, so that worked out well. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, I think that makes a huge difference too. Like I've noticed that how it looks on metallic paper is totally different than how it looks when I get the pearl finish or when I print on linen. So um, I definitely recommend um, yeah. getting a printer too and having um, you know having it done in all the different textures and and paper. Uh, paper options so that you can really find what really brings it out because I think different retouching styles lend themselves to different kind of papers and, and printing processes. For sure. So. Um, but that's that's pretty much it. That was a lot of information. I always talk too fast but I think that's most of it. So so yeah, it's it's pretty simple and the same thing. Now that I have done quite a few albums as I'm going um, I know what I'm looking for, uh, so now, because I know how I want my albums to look, I know how I need to shoot in order to get that, so I know that I'm looking to take shots that leave lots of empty space for me to put pictures on the sides, so that I don't have empty white pages and they don't look stark, because that just doesn't work for, for me and what I'm looking for, because it would annoy me as a client. So, like, this picture and that one, they're both background photos. Definitely. That one would totally work as well, but this one also has enough visual information that if I'm doing a page of all the food from the wedding, I can put that in a smaller um, smaller collection of images. Like those two might end up going next to each other. And then I'm just looking for uh, continuation. So it may be that I do um, that one, that one, and... Uh, that one, like those three would work well on a page because they're all about the groom and the groomsmen. That one's already used on the black and white. That one could definitely be used in that spread. Um, but if I'm shooting a smaller wedding where I don't have um, a lot of pictures or if I only took one or two of them getting ready, then these might all be detail shots. And I might be looking at... Um, 
doing like one spread where on this side it's photos of the groom and the groomsmen getting ready and on this side it's the bride and the bride getting ready or I might not have any of that if I don't meet up with them before the ceremony uh, to do all the getting ready shots then I'm usually looking for opportunities like the bride inevitably takes her shoes off at some point during the night and I'm just paying attention to things like that so that I can pull her shoes to the side and get pictures after um, same thing with the bouquets with uh, any little trinkets earrings stuff like that it's just as easy for me to get a shot of her earrings on her ear when she's putting them on as it is to get a shot of it while she's dancing in the first dance and she doesn't know what I'm taking pictures of so she thinks I'm taking pictures of their first dance and really I'm looking for opportunities to get the necklace or the back details of the dress um, and stuff like that so if I have the option it's always better to like lay the dress out and and have time to play while she's getting hair and makeup done or, or hanging out with the bridesmaids so I can really do uh, close-ups and not feel rushed with it and I can control the light and where I'm sitting them. Um, if you're not using uh, artificial light if you don't have on camera flash or you're not bringing lighting I'm always looking for windows because the windows are essentially what soft boxes were made to replicate you know like we talk about Rembrandt lighting he would sit them next to the window so same thing with detail shots I'm always looking to put them near a window so that we get the light off of them and if not then I have um, a single hot shoe flash um, and I'll go in and just make sure that I'm bouncing the light so I never want to have it directly on them I'm always aiming at the ceiling or at the wall or at a mirror um, even like in here I have like a big hutch um, it'll bounce off the glass really well if worse comes to worse I'll stand myself next to someone that's wearing a white shirt and bounce it off of their stomach um, but never directly on because you don't get the same kind of light sculpting that you get if it's coming from the side or from a different angle um, but that's that's pretty much it. Those are the basics. I mean, we kind of hit them, and then it's just variation of uh, the same kind of info. So if we're looking and we're going back, like we showed um, how to very quickly take this and make it essentially the same exact photo with the opposite one, it starts to look like a totally different photo as soon as you put in color elements and then you know if they were next to each other you want to make sure that they're also on different spots of the book so if I had this and then the next page was essentially this exact cutout but with color photos and I had the bouquet here and maybe her shoes or her and her sister getting ready then it would start to look repetitive um, so I want to do a different spread in between and then maybe the third spread is that collection but I take them and I flip them so that the two images are on this side and the first photos over here taking up most of the page so it's just little structural differences and then it'd be very easy to to take in right here and do uh, let's see. you know take uh, two images below and essentially I wouldn't do it like this but essentially put a, a cut and do two images so that is three right there and then you can do the same thing you know like maybe this is two landscape images right there you know so you can play with all kinds of different setups that are essentially the same same kind of stuff it just depends on how big like that one with four images up top I think the images are too small to appreciate um, so it'd be good if I had four images that were the same thing like if she was like you've no idea how much I love these shoes I need every picture of these shoes they're four hundred dollar um, you know uh, Louis Vuitton kind of shoes or whatever um, one two three four of the shoes and then whatever the best shot of the shoes is would make would make the big image and we would have a page that is just owed to the shoes Um, but that works and then same thing if we were doing this it'd be very easy to take these and just flip them so that the two verticals were on top and this was on the bottom and then take it and flip it that way or in contrast we could take it and if we took 
uh, the next image and we had the ability to um, like take these and move them here. They're all messed up now because the other ones are below, but So if we put these here, then we could take the white on the other side, like we were doing. And then we could just um, mimic it so that on the other side of it, this would come all the way to the edge, um, on the other side of it there'd be two images too and then the, the uh, shoes would go in the middle right down the spread so you could have two on this side and two on this side. But most of the work's already done at that point because you already know where you want to have them. So then you'd just be copying uh, the spread on this side and selecting these two and moving them over to here and then adding two different images. So, but it's it's totally different to take the time to actually build the spread and move them and set them up than to go, oh, you know what I can do? I can just add two more over here. And maybe this one is three images, one, two, three, and then we take it and we flip it so that it's one, two, three, so that you have this sort of asymmetrical symmetry going on. Um, but these images would definitely be black and white as well, so that color theory falls. And then if we did another one with... Um, this kind of color that I'm looking for other pictures that have these kind of tones in it um, and vice versa. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, do, do, you, do you shoot with a medium format or DSLR? Uh, for weddings I would definitely do just a DSLR. I don't, I don't see the need for files that big. Um, one, I shoot JPEG. I don't even shoot RAW when I'm shooting weddings. They don't I can do 20 by 30 prints, which is the largest size that I offer. Um, even video, when we're doing video for weddings, I can pull an 11 by 14 print out of a still frame from the video. They usually don't need bigger than that. In fact, I had the first album we were looking at, um, the, the superhero one that we were going through. She's like, I want a 20 by 30 print. I want it matted in frame. She was looking at one of the big prints on my walls in my studio. And then I went and I hand-delivered her album and I'm like, okay, I'm like, well, where are you putting this print? And she took me in. Like, the space that she has available for it is not 30 inches. It's at best, like, because I was like, you know, we're going to have the matting and the framing, so you're not looking at 20 by 30. You're looking at, like, maybe 26 by 36 when all's said and done. And she's like, oh, I was like, let's get out the measuring thing. So it came, like, three inches over her window. <laughs> and um, so it's important that you're you're talking to them and helping them understand that bigger isn't always better, depending on where they want to put it. So now I have clients send me photos of where they want to put their prints if they're doing wall prints. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, sh I shoot JPEG. It doesn't mean that everybody has to or that it's the right choice. But for me now... Um, I started shooting JPEG because I didn't know what RAW was because I just picked up a camera one day and was like, I'm going to take pictures now. Um, and then by the time I learned the benefits and the advantages of RAW, I was like, oh. But I had already gotten to the point where my photos are 80 to 90% of the way to where I need them to be in camera, and it's mostly just color casting. Like, I like shooting really warm tones, so, like, I don't have, like, actual true whites in any of my photos. People tease me all the time. They call it lark sepia um, because I don't. I don't have whites or blacks. I have, like, like buttercream and, like, very dark brown. <laughs> um, and that's part of my editing style, and they used to make me feel bad about it, but now I tell them to, you know, go go run your camera over with the car. <laughs> um, so, um, but with that, I'm always looking for what images fit together in that way. Um, and the editing that I do and the coloring that I'm adding, I don't need to fix my images, which is good. Um, and I'm a, an advocate for both. Because the bottom line is, is I don't buy off on the get it right in camera or be a Photoshop whiz. Like, and people in my cohort are both. Like, they're just starting, and I forget sometimes that they don't know how to do that. So I'm like, why didn't you edit that out? And they're like, because I don't know how. <laughs> um, 
So I'm fine with either. You can be amazing in Photoshop or you can be amazing behind the camera or you can be both. Both is ideal so that if you mess it up in camera, you can fix it in Photoshop. And if you get it right in camera, you can spend half the time in Photoshop so you can add it more images. Um, but the bottom line is, is that the clients don't care either. As long as when you hand them the image, it's a wow image. Who cares how you got there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's better for me to, because I shoot a lot of images, because I don't want to miss anything and I'm shooting the entire time, I would rather shoot JPEG and have smaller files um, and faster uh, record times on my card than taking the time to shoot raw and worry about, God forbid, me rapid firing an awesome moment and missing something essential because the the card's like we just need one second here we'll be right back you know and I'm like no I can't I, I it's got to be it's got to be the moment I'll take the moment over the clarity any day um and I've never had a client complain like nobody's ever looked at my albums or my prints and been like you shot this in jpeg didn't you you know so I think we spend so much time around other photographers um, that we forget that most of our clients, they don't care. They don't even know what we're talking about. Like I say I shoot raw and they think it's it's like a more X-rated version of my boudoir, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. All right, so that about uh, sums up most of what I think. An hour is a good time to cut it off. Um, did you have any last-minute questions? Um, no, I, I think, uh, you know, like I said, I got that one wedding to do. I... I always said I wasn't going to do weddings, but then somebody asked me to do a wedding last year, but she was a Photoshop whiz, so I just had to take the picture, so that was easy. And then the other one was a, I did a, a, a video for somebody, so I did the video for their wedding, so that turned out better than I thought it would. Awesome. <laughs> that was cool. Um, awesome. But this year, yeah, it's not till October that I don't have one, and I, like I said, I want to try to get back to my fine art stuff, too, so... Um, uh, then maybe looking into retouching a uh, company to handle them for you so that you're not spending the time. Yeah, you know, so like a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of people are doing it, like sending out their retouching stuff. I think if I was going to continue doing weddings as an actual thing, because for a while that was most of my income. Like my husband, he thought about divorcing me when I said I wasn't going to do weddings anymore because we were making a lot of money from them. And he's like, are you serious? You know, like, you think about it, like, eight to $12,000, I can make $100,000 doing, like, 10 weddings. So when I was like, um, nope, I'm not going to do it, he's like, mm, I hate you. <laughs> but we got through it. It took some time and some therapy and, you know, like, the NFL package on TV, and then he was fine. Um but uh, I'm such a big believer that you have to do whatever excites you and whatever sets your soul on fire. And if you're not doing that, you will burn out. And I liked doing weddings, but I liked teaching more. I couldn't do weddings and teach at the Arcanum. They're too time demanding, both of them. Um, and I, as much as I love the romance and I'm a hopeless romantic, like there's only so much creativity you can have with them, and I want to, like, design epic sets and stuff like that. So if I wanted to do weddings for the income now, um, I would probably shoot them and send them out because there's different retouching companies that can actually get pretty close to your own editing style. Um, and you send it out, you pay a couple hundred bucks, it ships back. It'd be totally worth it for me for the time change because I get paid well enough to, to warrant uh, putting out that extra expense for some people just getting started. Like my first year, I was charging like between two fifty and seven fifty for a wedding. It, I wouldn't have made any money if I had sent them out. Um, but uh, but if I had sent them out with where my retouching skills were at the time, I probably could have charged a higher price too. So it's a trade off. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as long as you're like building those costs into what you're charging, then you can absolutely do that and then free up your time to do your fine art stuff too. Gotcha. So, all right, I have to go because I have a critique with Marjorie. Thanks for hanging out. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for the invite. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. All right, bye.